Uh, as Brady briefly mentioned, I actually have a, a few jobs. I have three jobs. I'm the data artist in residence at the New York Times. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at a program called ITP, which is uh, at, at New York University, and I also have my own software art practice. Today I'm going to talk to you about two different projects which, which are going to span quite a lot of range, and in conceptual range as well as physical range. And so the title of this talk, we can tap our inner Sesame Street listener when you see the title. The title of the talk is Near Far. So let's start with, with Near. A couple of um, years ago, I was working as, the, uh, as a contributing editor, editor for Wired Magazine in the UK. I was responsible for a part of the magazine which was very subtly titled Info Porn. And I had the opportunity during one of my projects to work with um, this man, who uh, some of you in the room may be familiar with. Um, Dr. Barabashi is one of the world's leading experts in network science. And we worked together on a project which investigated human mobility. We looked at, at how people were traveling. And the way that, that Dr. Barabashi was finding out how people traveled was looking at this massive database of locational information that had been donated by a large telecom from an unnamed European country. I mean, the European country has a name. I'm just not allowed to tell you what it is today. So, we, we ended up looking at this data in all kinds of different ways and, and explored some of the research that, that, that Lashlow was doing. And, and the research pointed out some really interesting things that wouldn't, would have been very hard to find had he not had this massive database of locational data. Specifically, one of the findings was that all of us, no matter who we are, really, are, are very predictable in our behaviors. So if we look at a month's worth of, of travel information of locational data, we can categorize people very closely, and our, our day becomes very predictable. Now, this can be somewhat scary because we can find out, um, we, can, we can very accurately guess where any of us are going to be at any given time. But it also is tremendously valuable information. It's tremendously valuable information for uh, researchers like epidemiologists or people who are studying emergency response. This location data is like gold for those types of people. So to bring the discussion back to almost exactly here, last year at WARE conference, everybody uh, who was here and everybody probably who wasn't here saw this article, um, which, which was this this discussion of this very surprising fact to some people that our iPhones were storing location data. So at the, at the R&D lab, we were very surprised by, by this article, like a lot of people were. But actually, my immediate thought came back to this project that I worked with, with Lashul Barabashi, and I thought, maybe we can collect this location data and offer it up to researchers as a base of data that they could use for the public good. So we started this project called Open Paths, which al allowed people to do just that. So what the project allows you to do is it allows you to upload your data to a central location, store it securely, explore the data, and then maybe most importantly, engage in a transaction with researchers who want to be able to use that project in their, in their studies. So, we launched this project originally to use the iPhone location data, and I'm not going to get into too much detail about that iPhone location data, but as it turned out, that particular data set was maybe not as interesting to researchers as we had hoped it would be. So since then, we've relaunched the project. We've relaunched the project as a set of apps. There's an app for Android, there's an app for iDevices, where you can track your location data, store it securely, and explore it on our website. So if you go to the Open Paths website, here's the Open Paths website, you're able to start up an account and start storing your location data. Once you've stored your location data, you can explore it in a couple of different ways. So we have some very simple maps which allow us to look at things like, what are the, the time of day patterns in your travel? So here we see evening as red and, and uh, morning as yellow and, and, a, and a gradient of color in between. We can also look at day and night patterns. We can also look at, at weekday and weekend patterns. So this type of, of engagement with the data is really interesting for people. And we've had a lot of people who, who have signed up for the project and, and have explored and uploaded their data. 
One of the things that we really wanted to talk about with this project was this idea of data ownership. This idea that people can own and, and have control over their own data, I think is something relatively new for most of our users. Now, most of us in, in this room sort of understand this relationship between, between users and their data, this third party, second party, first party relationship. But the average person with an iPhone doesn't understand that. And most of us in this room also understand this fact. This, this is from a document um, published recently, which is a guidebook for district attorneys who want to use location data that they've um, subpoenaed from people's cell phones. But the important part here is that cellular phones have become these virtual biographers of our daily activities. And this is something that we, we have found has been um, really an interesting outcome from this project. As people are uploading their data, as people are donating their data, they're realizing something about this information that they're donating. They're realizing that this information is not just numbers. They're thinking, okay, researchers want my data. I'm gonna upload this, these numbers. What they're realizing is that these numbers that they're donating are also parts of their lives. So these, these location points are assembling narratives that are important to them. And I think by understanding that this data is something that is precious to them, it also makes sense and makes them feel a little bit better about donating this to researchers. So by donating this research, um, da this data to researchers, we want to establish a relationship that has not happened before between the people who are generating the data and the people that are using the data. So here's what our research page looks like. And if anybody in the room um, runs a research project that may be interested in using location data, you can go to the Open Pass site and you can sign up your project. So a researcher is able to come to the Open Pass site, they're able to pitch a project, and then depending on who they might want to find out, find from our database, so they might be interested in just people from New York or just people from Spain or whatever the case may be, they're able to directly negotiate a transaction with those people. So they get an email sent to them that says, hey, there's a research project that wants to use your open pass data and you can click here and implicitly agree that you would like to share their data um, with the researcher. So we're kind of, hoping to foster this, this kind of data philanthropy where people are able to take this information which is very valuable to them and at this point really only being used by other people, take control over that data and donate it to a cause which they feel like is going to be a, be a valuable one. This project has, has just gotten off the ground and for me this is the most interesting part of it is this, this ability for us to cooperate with, with the research community. And so I'm going to use that cooperation with the research community to, to jump to something completely different. I know it's the morning and, and a lot of you were at the party last night and, and I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this sort of map-based loca location information that's been um, so prevalent so far over the last few days. And instead, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to another project which explores this direct relationship with researchers, but in this case, a direct relationship between me and, and a research group. And, and we're gonna move very, 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 very far away. We're gonna move from a project which started here to a project that started um, millions of kilometers away. So, how many of you in the room are familiar with the Kepler project? Just a few people. So the Kepler project is a project from NASA which has been tasked to find what are called exoplanet candidates. These are objects that are floating in space which may very well be distant planets. And so far the project has been very successful. They're about two years in and they've found 2,326 exoplanet candidates. Out of those 2,326 candidates, um, almost 48 of them, actually exactly 48 of them, are in what we call the habitable zone. So these are projects, or planets, which may very well at some point prove to be a future of humanity, somewhere where we can travel to and, and, and live on an alien world. This is really exciting data, and it's the type of data that I get really, really, really interested in, because it's data that, that contains so much character. And so, Last week I spent some time with a company who you're gonna hear about a little bit later today called Oblong. And Oblong is doing some really amazing things with, with interaction. And we decided to build a tool which would allow people to navigate this 
really interesting set of, of, of exoplanet candidates in, a, in an interesting way. So what we did is we built this software tool, and it allows you to literally fly through this Kepler universe and look at these exoplanets. I built this project last year statically on the web, and we really wanted to look at how we could make this data more expressive and more exciting. So here are all of the exoplanet candidates orbiting as if they were orbiting around the same star. And as we pan out here, you're going to see that there are all kinds of these, these planets at varying distances from their star. And in a second, I'm going to start picking some of these planets. And I can find some information about these planets using this gestural interface. So I'm going to pick a, a, a couple of planets. These are colored right now from a, a, their temperature. So the red planets are very hot. The yellow planets are a little bit cooler. The green planets are a little bit cooler still. And actually, Earth, if we were going to look at Earth, is a little bit farther away from the outside. So we take this data, which, which is presented normally in this dry scientific manner. We put it into the system where people are able to explore um, what's happening with this project. And I'm just going to let, I'm going to let this um, video play for a second and, and, and let you get a, a look at what's happening here. And the only thing that I'll let you know is that I'm in the middle of, of building this project out for the web right now. It'll be released hopefully within, within two weeks. You'll be able to um, view this Kepler system within your own uh, browser and on your um, iPhone devices. The project is called EXO. All right, so we've gone from a very near um, focus project, OpenPass, which I hope people will take an opportunity to explore and, and hopefully get involved as researchers to this very far um, out project called EXO. And, and I hope you, you enjoy taking a look at it. And thanks very much.